first half of September 1942. It's time to fight back. It might take very long, but history shows that sooner or later the pressure of oppression is so high that acts of resistance, suicidal and futile as they might be, start to build up. In World War II, that turning point is early September 1942, when more and more resist. This is War Against Humanity, a subseries of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. In late August, we saw how the Luftwaffe bombed Stalingrad, killing tens of thousands of civilians who had not been permitted to flee the city by Stalin. In the middle of the hundred deadliest days of the Holocaust, the murder operations in Treblinka broke down, causing even more suffering and death. Hitler issued new orders to fight the persisting resistance by partisans in the East, both in the USSR and occupied Yugoslavia. In Germany, where there is little resistance to begin with, the major resistance networks started getting dismantled by the Gestapo while new networks began to form. In occupied Western Europe, resistance was slow to mount, possibly due to the somewhat less violent oppression by the Nazi occupiers. But that oppression is about to increase, and it will now give birth to more resistance. On September 4, 1942, French Prime Minister Pierre Laval and Chief of State Philippe Pétain signed the Loi relative à l'utilisation et l'orientation de la main d'œuvre, a law on the use and guidance of the workforce. This so-called relève, or relief scheme, arranges an exchange program with Germany. For every three French workers sent to Germany, one French prisoner of war will be released. It might look like a patriotic way to release POWs, but in reality it is a thinly disguised collaboration by the Vichy regime to supply the German slave economy that I covered in a recent special episode. Link is in the description. Over 300,000 young workers will be press ganged into going to Germany. For the French resistance, this presents a recruitment opportunity as young people selected for forced labor in Germany begin fleeing into the countryside ready to join the resistance. La Résistance is, however, in little position to capitalize on it at this point. There are five resistance organizations, Combat, Libération Sud, Front Tireur, Comédie d'Action Socialiste, and Front National, not to be confused with the later political party of the same name. Not only are they at times in direct opposition to each other, within each of them the cells are small and disjointed. Perhaps the only common denominator beyond opposing Vichy and the Germans is that they have been unwilling to cooperate with the Free French outside of France under Charles de Gaulle. To change this, de Gaulle sent Jean Moulin, codenamed Rex, to France in early 1942 with coffers full of money and promises of arms deliveries. Moulin is a former Vichy public servant who in 1941 had refused to collaborate, been imprisoned, escaped, and fled to Great Britain. He's been negotiating with little success to get the resistance leaders to unite for eight months. But now Combat, Libération Sud, and the Front Tireurs have finally agreed to merge their militant sections into the Armée Secrète. In the first week of September, their forces are united under command of resistance operative and former French Army General Charles de Lestrin, codenamed Vidal. It is a sign of change to come, but by no means the beginning of French resistance as depicted in post-war cinema and television. That kind of widespread and active resistance does pick up in other places in September 42, though. One place is Poland. The resistance here received severe blows already as it started in 1939, first by the preemptive mass murder of Polish intelligentsia by the Nazis, then by the Soviet persecution in their zone of occupation. Like we've seen in 1940, resistance persevered though, and the underground Polish state and the Armia Krajowa, home army, was formed. With yet more setbacks, they have, however, been laying relatively low, preparing for a future when they hope to fight to liberate Poland as the Allies attack Germany. That date has not arrived, and the situation in Poland continues to deteriorate. Like in France, but with more severity, it is the Nazi slave policies that is affecting non-Jewish Poles mostly. And although the Jewish Poles and the resistance have had a mixed relationship and the resistance has not helped the Polish Jews on any large scale to date, 
the beginning of mass murders of the Jews on Polish soil earlier this year has rattled some resistance operatives into action. Some Jews have managed to flee the ghettos and form their own resistance cells. Only few have been accepted into the non-Jewish resistance. In any case, across all parts of the Polish resistance, which by now counts more than 100,000 members, preparations for active resistance is underway. As the hope for a swift Allied attack continue to dwindle, it looks more and more likely that these operations will have to happen only from the inside. But the most pressing situation is for the Poles who are Jewish, who are now being shipped to the extermination factories by the hundreds of thousands each month. There is simply no way to save them all when faced by the German and Nazi military machine. Even trying to save a single Jew is a near certain suicide mission, but some will try. Since the Grossaktion in the Warsaw Ghetto started in July, Irena Sendler, codenamed Yolanta, has been secretly shuttling in and out of the ghetto day and night. She is a social worker and an intellectual who has been fighting against systemic anti-Semitism in Poland despite being non-Jewish since her university days in the early 30s. Together with a dozen other social workers, she is smuggling Jewish children out of the ghetto one after the other. Adults are too well monitored to flee unnoticed. The children are given false papers, and Yolanta's network finds places for them among willing families, convents, and orphanages. Altogether, they save some 2,500 children. They will live, but their parents, siblings, and relatives are taken by the thousands daily to be murdered at Treblinka, where the murder machine is once again running at full speed after the breakdown in August. On September 10th, another transport from the Polish capital arrives with between 5,000 and 6,000 Jewish men. Women and children are gassed on arrival living, breathing humans relegated into the statistic of 200,000 murdered in the first two weeks of September in Operation Reinhardt. Among the arrivals that day are Meyer and Rachel Berliner and their daughter Rosa. Argentinian Jews caught up in the German invasion in 39 while visiting family in Warsaw. Rachel and Rosa are killed on arrival. Meyer and a few other able-bodied men are selected to stay alive for now and work the gas chambers and crematories. The new arrivals are to replace exhausted workers on the details who will now be murdered. At roll call that evening, they are ordered to separate into old and new arrivals. Knowing what will come, the men hesitate. The guards start beating them into their groups. At that moment, a man jumped out of the ranks, ran towards the commanding officer Oberschaufführer Max Bialas with a drawn knife and stabbed him in the back. He did the deed, then stood by, hesitating. Meyer Berliner has avenged his wife and daughter. On the spot, one of the Ukrainian guards beats Meyer to death using a shovel. Ten more inmates are selected randomly and immediately shot in front of the others. Max Bialas succumbs to his wounds the next day. Christian Wirt, overseer of the death factories, is still at Treblinka and orders another 150 in the work details killed as reprisal. Further east, there is more resistance brewing out of desperation. When the Germans overran Western USSR in 1941, thousands of young Jewish men and women were able to flee before being rounded up. Yet more Soviet Jews in the Red Army soon found themselves behind the German enemy lines. Tens of thousands are tracked down by the Germans or have their hiding places betrayed by non-Jewish countrymen, are killed or taken to the ghettos and forced labor camps. By now, the large ghettos have been dissolved. The inhabitants added one after the other to the more than 1.5 million murdered by the Einsatzgruppen. But many of the smaller ghettos remain in place as pawns in a brutal hostage game. One man, Mordecai Zajcik, is interned at the forced labor camp in Hansavici together with 150 other Jewish men from the township Lenin in Belarus. 1,000 of their friends, relatives, and families remain in the Lenin ghetto. Every day our determination to run away grew stronger. It was clear to us that our fate was likely to be the same as all of the Jewish communities, and we understood that we should not deceive ourselves that we would transform the murderers into good men. We knew that if we ran away it would bring about a disaster for our brothers, sisters, and parents left at home. Our escape would speed the death sentence of the members of our community. 
For now, we knew they were still alive. Policemen, the sons of the farmers in the area, would bring us letters from them. But now that the operation to murder every single Jew in Europe is underway, the small ghettos are no longer spared, including in Lenin. They took them to the well-known Bloody Hill on the main road to the village of Stajbelovici, opposite the orchard of the Agarkov farm. Deep ditches had already been dug there. At the edges of the ditches, the cursed murderers undressed the people of our town and took their clothes and opened fire on them with machine guns. The shocked screams were heard by the Christian residents who were eyewitnesses to the massacre. The bodies of our martyrs rolled and fell into the ditches. The killers arranged the bodies in layers, one on top of the other, and blood mixed with blood. The blood of babies mixed with that of their mothers, grandfathers, and grandmothers. A few families of skilled workers, in all 28, are left alive as slave labor for the German occupiers and the Christian inhabitants of the town. When Mordecai and his comrades hear of the fate of their families, they have nothing to lose and escape. Many are recaptured, but Mordecai and a few dozen others manage to join the partisans. In the same weeks of August and early September, the people in the nearby ghettos of Mikashevici, Horodok, and Lachva meet the same fate. But on September 3rd in Lachva, the Jews will also not go silently to their graves. The men there, and also the young, were not taken to work camps. When the Nazis came to massacre them, the young people set the ghetto on fire, killed a few of the soldiers from the companies of Nazis that held the ghetto under siege, and ran away into the forests and swamps. Most were hunted down one by one by the Christian population around the city and delivered to the Nazis. In spite of that, many of the runaways were saved and joined the partisans and were able to participate in the war of revenge against the enemies of humanity. It is the first ghetto uprising in a war that will now also be visited on the murderers in Lenin. Yehuda Tsiklik and Zhevjevin, also from Lenin, were fighting in the Red Army in 41 and then joined the partisans. Yehuda now convinces their non-Jewish commander that they should use the opportunity of a reduced force at Lenin to attack, steal whatever materials they can, and rescue any survivors. Yehuda and Zhev are sent to spy out the town. They conclude that a reduced force of 100 Wehrmacht personnel and around 30 local policemen are in the town. A force of 120 partisans is pulled together, and on September 12th, they launch a surprise attack. Fighting their way from the outer perimeter of Lenin, they close in on the German garrison. After a heavy firefight, three German officers, including the garrison's commandant, 14 soldiers, and 13 policemen are killed. The Germans are forced to retreat, and among blazing fires, Yehuda sets out to look for survivors. I met a young man wearing a policeman's uniform from the village of Plostovich and a Nazi employee. When he saw me, he remained in his place like he was nailed to the ground. Without thinking much, I shot the Nazi employee with a modern weapon that I had obtained from his employer. Wonderful weapon. The evil employee fell before he could speak. I continued to run. I crossed the bridge over the lake and came to our house at the edge of town. And here I stand in front of our house, and I don't hear anything. A deathly silence prevails in the house where I spent my childhood, where I grew up, where a loving mother hugged me and a father's hand stroked me. I stood in front of the house and my heart moaned inside of me. I made an effort to walk away. And here came the priest's wife, whose house was next door to ours, and told me that there were over 20 Jewish survivors in Avraham Jitschak Chinit's house. I quickly rushed over there, and a few minutes later I saw myself surrounded by people from our community. Yehuda Schuster and his family, Nuska's daughter with her twin babies in her arms, and her husband. But soon the Germans have regrouped and start a counterattack. The partisans set the town ablaze and leave with a cache of weapons, ammunitions, the valuables of the murdered Jews, and the survivors. Among them is Fania Lazimnik, also known as Faye Schulman. She's a professional photographer and will go on to document life in the partisan ranks where more and more Jewish men and women are now fighting back in the war against humanity. They are fulfilling a promise of divine retribution in the poem, The Lonely Mound, by Manshe ben Yezrael, another survivor of the Lenin massacre. Inside the forest, between fields, meadows, a dirt mound is rising on our beloved brothers. 
Long is the mound hiding a thousand martyrs, fathers and sons, grandfathers and great-grandsons. Isolated and desolated in a blood-soaked earth, lonely and orphaned away from the community. There is no one to pray on their grave, take pity on their dust, saturate it with tears and lament their memory. They will be mourned from a distance. Their names will be dedicated with broken hearts and tears by their surviving sons. Rest in peace. You will be remembered forever. A mighty God who resides for eternity will avenge your blood. Never forget. Thank you.